host, Dr. Sandy Laura Kramers. Thank you again for joining us for the EYE Show podcast. Thank you to all those patients that have subscribed and patients that are not our patients that have subscribed and for coming to visit, visit us at Visionary Eye Doctors. We're located in Washington, D.C. area in Rockville, Maryland. That's where I see patients. So thank you again. Uh, we get, of course, a lot of questions every uh, month, every day here at Visionary Eye Doctors. And one of the most common questions I get either by email or in patients that I see is, should I get a blood workup for autoimmune disease? And some of you have heard me talk about our research on the mybography as a diagnostic indicator for autoimmune disease. And more and more every week, we see more patients that were diagnosing very uncommon autoimmune diseases based on mybography. And just to recap what we've talked about briefly, especially for those patients on YouTube, you can see this, but if you're on the podcast, you'll, I know you've probably seen this before, but there is these mybomian glands, you've heard it before from me many times, that are located kind of hidden in the eyelid. Every eyelid has about, you're born with, we think about 30 to 40. And as we get older, they start to dry up like everything in our body, mucous membranes dry up. And so it kind of looks like this with these white lines filled with oil. And as we go get older, they dry up. And my theory is that this mybomian gland, as well as the goblet cells and lacrimal gland, which we cannot image, we can only image right now very clearly the cellular structure of the mybomian gland, the three components of the tear film, mybomian gland, the mybum that produces the fatty part, the oily part. The second is the goblet cell that produces the ache, the um, mucin. <laughs> it's on the surface of the conjunctiva. but we don't really have an easy way to show patients or image that or show a picture of that. And then the lacrimal gland, which is located under the orbit that produces the water or aqueous. We only have CAT scans or ultrasounds, but it doesn't give us the granular detail that the mybography does. And my theory is that these cells are the most sensitive cells in our body and most inflammation will affect these cells first. So whatever inflammation, inflammatory condition is happening, these cells tend to feel it faster. I, that's my theory. And I've seen it now time and again, and that was the reason, uh, that's what, that was a finding we found in that first paper we published in the AJ, the American Journal of Ophthalmology in 2021, where we looked at all the children that were having severe mybomian gland atrophy and were very surprised to find that a little bit less than 50% were positive for an autoimmune disease marker. And so that paper kind of showed me that whenever we see severe mybomian gland atrophy, and this is what it kind of looks like, where these white lines, there's almost nothing left. And when that happens, there's something that has gone wrong. It could be, of course, from things like blepharitis, which means you have these little mites called demodex, real life mites that kind of clog the orifice and cause styes sometimes or scar tissue. It could be from, of course, a trauma, uh, but that's really rare to have it in all four lids, maybe just one lid. Uh, of course, previous surgery, things like genetics, rosacea, screen time is a big issue, allergic conjunctivitis. So those things can cause my booming gland dysfunction, but when I have a patient that really is on the screens very little, maybe not that old, has really no history of allergic conjunctivitis, was not a contact lens user, all those things can make the gland dry up faster, and they don't have that much demodex history or chalazion, have never had eyelid surgery, and I see the glands dried up, it makes me very concerned for an autoimmune disease, even if they don't have yet dry mouth and arthritis. And so the classic triad, when somebody says, should I get, it used to be that when somebody would say, should I get a blood workup for something, or even a friend or family, I would say, well, do you have dry eye? Do you have symptoms of dry eye? Do you have a dry mouth? Meaning, you know, you when you eat some crackers or something, you feel like you have to drink water because it doesn't feel like you could produce saliva. Or arthritis, joint aches, feeling your joints, if you had that triad, and that's because those tissues of the lacrimal gland and the mybomian gland and the goblet, the tear film is so sensitive. The mouth, the salivary glands are have sensitive mucous membrane cells that are very sensitive to inflammation. And the joint synovial fluid cells, those cells are very sensitive to inflammation. So if we had that triad, we'd say absolutely, you should get checked for Sjogren's syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus. We would go through a whole list of possible issues, even diabetes. You know, we would look at all those blood tests to see. And we would sometimes pick up very unusual conditions, uh, polyangitis, uh, all types of 
Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis sometimes will manifest like this. Uh, so a whole slew. There's actually more than about 80 autoimmune diseases or autoimmune related conditions that even rosacea is technically considered now an autoimmune concern. Uh, but we would pick it, you know, pick it up sometimes, and it's hard to know what the what the chance of picking it up. But I've diagnosed thousands and thousands of patients if they have those three symptoms. What I'm finding now is that we can treat the kind of marker in quotes. And when we see a, a kind of the my booming gland very dried up, symptoms of dry eyes, and there's no arthritis or joint aches, I still will do a blood workup. And I've been surprised by how many have been positive, especially things like thyroid, eye disease, hypo or hyperthyroid, Graves disease, uh, a lot of rheumatoid arthritis, a lot of Sjogren's syndrome, lupus. And then most recently I had a patient who came in, a military um, veteran, uh, has had dry eyes for now about 10 years. He came in to see me and his glands were significantly dried and he didn't really have any joint aches or dry mouth when I asked him. But on further questioning, he eventually said, you know, he's been having some sinus discomfort and a little bit of a dry cough here and there from time to time. He just thought it was older age. And when he did the full blood workup, he turned out to have a positive C ANCA, A-N-C-A, which stands for anti-nuclear cytoplasmic antibody, which was, we think, is the diagnosis of Wegener's granulomatosis, which is a significant, potentially deadly disease. And so we're picking it up probably years before it would otherwise have been picked up. As I told this patient about 23 years ago when I was at Boston, um, we published one of my first papers with, was with Dr. Foster on a patient who came to see me who was a young woman who had just had a baby and she had terrible kind of sinusitis and coughing and coughing and everyone thought it was just postpartum, you know, postnasal drip and no issues and she'd been gotten seen many, many specialists. But she came to see me because her eyes were red and dry. And we did not have myography at that time, but I probably could guess that if we had, it'd be very the glands would have been dried up because her eyes looked really red and dry. And when we checked the ANCA, she had Wegener's granulomatosis and we were able to treat her to save her life. And so she was surprised that it took two years to diagnose her Wegener's because her symptoms started two years earlier. So that's what were the beauty of these. The meibomian glands is that we can actually now pick up, I think, autoimmune disease earlier. So if you are a patient or you have a loved one that has any of these symptoms, anything unusual that you're not sure, is it an autoimmune disease? Is it worth going through this very expensive workup? And, the, and the, these blood tests I'm going to go through in just a few minutes are not cheap, especially if you don't have insurance or if you have a big copay. Um, so, you know, is it worth it or not? It's worth to come in. Most ophthalmologists now have a myography. Most ophthalmology offices, I think, cover that cost. I think here we used to charge $29 or something like that, but it's not even that much anymore. I think it's included in the price of the visit now. So it's very cheap. And you can see whether or not you even should be concerned to some extent. It's not 100% uh, guaranteed. We're still looking at kind of the po false positives, the false negatives, and the reliability of this test. But if you have glands that look perfect, in my experience, the chance of you having an autoimmune disease is probably less than 2%. If you have no glands at all, or there's very few glands left, and you really are not a big IT screen person, your chance of having an autoimmune disease, in my experience, is about 70%. So it's not 100%, but it just tells you whether or not we should really, you know, kind of do the blood tests. And most blood tests are very, if you have insurance, it's no real cost, it's very insignificant time, and it can make a big difference in you getting the treatment you need earlier to prevent problems in the future. So let me go through the blood tests. And then we're going to go what do you should do if one of the blood tests is positive. So the blood test that we generally will do is this is the full autoimmune disease panel. If you know of any other autoimmune disease blood tests that are not on here, we have a lot of researchers that listen to this uh, podcast with the NIH and other doctors, uh, please let me know. So here are the standard ones we know of that we have pretty much helped us diagnose many patients over the last few years. Uh, the first one, of course, is a CBC. Uh, hemoglobin A1C, I like to just check for diabetes. Sed rate is a general, non-specific, 
uh, called ESR or SED rate is a non-specific inflammatory test, a test for inflammation of general inflammation in your body. You could have a positive SED rate even without an autoimmune disease, but we're going to go through my theory on that. Uh, C-reactive protein, same thing, general marker of autoimmune disease. ANA, standard marker for general autoimmune disease, but very commonly positive in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, or any of the um, autoimmune diseases. And then the next one are the thyroid function tests like T3, T4, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, and TSI, thyroid stimulating uh, inhibitor. So those are trying to identify any type of inflammation in the thyroid. And just as a kind of follow-up of the previous podcast that we did where we had the patient with the eyelid kind of droopiness, that patient turned out to have a thyroid issue. I think it's Graves' disease, which is a thyroid issue. And we caught it early because of the eye, coming in for the eyelid issue. Wasn't We didn't see the myography yet, but he should get a myography. The next one is called the early Sjogren's syndrome markers, SJO. It used to be a very, very expensive $2,000 test when it came out. Uh, we the, the company was very kind to actually sponsor a lot of the kids that we did check in that first paper. Um, I think for the first couple of kids and then the rest of the time, the patient's insurance covered it, so now insurance covers it. It's looking for parotid-specific protein, uh, CA, which is carbonic anhydrase uh, 6, SP1 is salivary protein one. So it has a whole bunch. I think it's 29 autoimmune disease markers that actually check for inflammation of the parotid gland, salivary gland, and general inflammation. Uh, Sjogren's, the classic ones, Sjogren's, antibody, anti-A, anti-B. So SSA, SSB, looking for those two markers. The uh, Rheumatoid factor, IgM, of course, is always checked. And then the ANCA, P-ANCA, and C-ANCA, if a patient has symptoms that are a little bit more generalized or they have any other issues going on, such as sinusitis, bloody nose, uh, something a little more unusual, we'll do a a P or C-ANCA. The P-ANCA is more specific to ulcerative colitis. The C-ANCA positivity Positivity is more specific to Wegener's granulomatosis, which generally affects your kidneys. Uh, It's not that common we see patients with eye issues, but I've had two cases in my career, and so we do, of course, think about that. And then HLA-B27, if somebody has back pain, we'll check to make sure they don't have ankylosing spondylitis. So those are the kind of things we're thinking of, and then sometimes there'll be some other specific uh, things that'll prompt us to do a specific marker, which is more uncommon. So let's say you get one of those blood work panels and everything is negative except one of the carbonic anhydrase four is positive or six is positive and that's it what do you do with that or what if you do the whole blood work and everything is negative and just your ANA is positive or just your C-reactive protein is positive well it could be a false positive sometimes we'll repeat it again but uh, what I tell patients is if there's anything positive, what I highly recommend is to start the anti-inflammatory diet. And we're going to go through what that means. So I've had many patients, especially early on when we started finding these, these findings, that there would be two non-specific markers, positive or maybe just one. And rheumatologists are not going to treat that I can find as of 2024, 2024, they're not going to treat patients for Sjogren's syndrome if just one of the Sjogren's antibodies is positive that is not the SSA or SSB. Most of them wait until at least one, really both, are positive. And the reason is because the medications like methotrexate, Plaquenil, steroids, immunosuppressives have risks. And so at that point, they're not clear if the risks uh, outweigh the benefit of starting you on a medication. If both of the po- of, are positive or your ANA is positive, very strongly positive, and then there's a bunch of other markers positive, like a rheumatoid factor, then yes, you probably will be treated for rheumatoid arthritis, whether it's juvenile or adult onset. And so that will kind of be easy to treat in some sense because they know the benefits of the medication, the treatment outweighs the risks. But if you really have just eye symptoms and it's not that severe in quotes, according to the rheumatologist, they are very hesitant to treat with these more aggressive medications. And I understand because there are risks. So what should you do? Well, I tell patients, start the anti-inflammatory diet, decrease your inflammation as much as you can. The name of the game of life in terms of the physical side, not the spiritual side, but the name of the game of the physical side is to decrease inflammation. And so things like 
decrease in your gluten, sugar, dairy, I would argue go gluten-free, sugar-free, and dairy-free in that order. Uh, trying to really go organic if you can, eat wild salmon instead of farm-raised salmon. You're trying to decrease your inflammation in every natural way possible. Intermittent fasting, checking with your medical doctor on all this if you have any medical history of diabetes or any insulin issues, or if you feel like you're not able to fast, of course, check with your doctor first. But we know that intermittent fasting and even prolonged fasting for those people that have tried it decreases inflammatory inflammation in general. And there are some studies starting to come out that it may decrease inflammatory markers. And that's the next wave of research people are looking to prove with antibody markers that these types of diets really make a difference. Things like exercise, prayer, meditation, sleeping, uh, decreasing your stress probably has a good effect. That's a little bit more hard to quantify its effect on these markers. I haven't seen a good study to show that they really make kind of a tangible difference, but I think the diet is a big issue and general exercise and sleeping well, don't smoke, don't be around smokers, uh, watch your environmental risk factors. Those things make sense to me and I do that for myself and for my family. So things like that, I've seen markers, and it's again, it's hard to prove it wasn't a false positive, but I have seen markers go from positive to negative, and it's hard to know what's the real reason behind it, but I've seen it so many times, I don't know, I don't think it's a false positive, I think there's a lot you can do with your diet choices. So if there are a significant number of positive markers, we send you to a rheumatologist to work with us to help you get your inflammatory markers to decrease your inflammation to decrease. We work on diet. We'll send you to your PCP and work with a nutritionist to try to talk about things you can do to naturally decrease your inflammation. And then we follow you. We follow you over time. We check your myography at least once a year, sometimes more. And we try to do everything we can to save those sensitive glands of the eyelids. Of course, you work with your uh, rheumatologist in terms of joints, if you have any joint issues, and even kind of your, sometimes your ENT will get involved if you have dry mouth. But we work together as a team to make sure that the inflammation is stopped and decreased, trying to do everything we can to really limit it. As we've talked about before, or some of these conditions I do think are reversible, such as diabetes and autoimmune disease. I think diabetes type 2 can be reversed. Type 1, we haven't been able to do that yet, although there's a lot of research in the genetic sphere on that. But type 2 diabetes is right now mostly curable. Just don't eat carbohydrates if you can. So for a lot of our patients have been treating and curing their diabetes, curing in quotes their diabetes. So they just really decrease their carbohydrates and that is the best thing you can do for your overall brain health, your eye health, your overall health, because diabetes makes everything worse. And so really trying to just, I tell patients, if you want to have a little bit of carbohydrates or sugar or gluten or bread or a cookie, then plan to run right after, walk or do exercise after. You wanna to try to keep your sugars as stable because changes of sugars increase your inflammation. That affects every cell of your body and we see it very clearly on the mybography. So that's what I wanted to talk about today. I hope you found this interesting. Please subscribe to our channel. Please pass this on to friends and family. Always come visit us at Visionary Eye Doctors if you have any questions. Thanks for joining us, have a great day.